So the nonlinear oscillator is a very interesting problem, and I think it serves as a good segue into the topic of nonlinearity. And specifically, when we talk about nonlinearity here, we're talking about geometric nonlinearity. Spring constants k1 and k2 can assume to be constant. And at first blush, when we look at this, we think, well, this is the simple harmonic oscillator, right? Um, we know the equations of motion here. It's just mx double dot, or in this case, x1, plus kx1 equals 0, and then the same thing in the x2 direction. But on closer inspection, we think, well, you know, what if we displace this mass quite a lot to this position here? And if that happens, what exactly do I need to consider? So perhaps give the video a brief pause and just think a little while about how would you treat this? How would you write the potential energy for the springs? Because then we could plug it into Lagrange's equations, and then we've got our equations of motion and we're away. And do we do x1 as a function of x2? Or what exactly do we do here? So I'll start out by drawing the unit vectors in the x1 and x2 direction. I'll call that e1 hat and e2 hat. Those are just unit vectors. And now consider some point here that we'll just call p, just a random point. And p is equal to x1, x2. Now the next thing I can do is just mark some geometry on the diagram. Um, we'll call this point p1 here next to spring 1. And that is at a position of minus L1 and 0, considering the mass initially when it's in equilibrium is at 0, 0. And this point at the bottom we'll call P2, and P2 is at a location 0, minus L2. Next thing I can do is construct the following vectors from point P1 to P and point P2 to P. And I'll call these vectors R1 and R2, respectively. Now something you might be asking yourself at this point is, if I found the stretch in the spring, say this spring K2, which is represented by this vector here, is K2 still in the, the negative E2 direction? I mean, is K2 still downwards? Because it would appear that K2 is at an angle. And in the past, we've typically considered small deformations, and we say displacements are small and rotations are small. But we don't really talk about what do we mean by small rotations. And actually, what we mean by small rotations is exactly this, is an element like the second spring K2 or spring K1 would not rotate from its original geometry. In other words, the spring's coordinate system would not change under a small displacement theory. So part of the thing that you need to consider when, when considering large or moderate displacements, non-small displacements, is the fact that the coordinate system of the element changes. And in this case, what I would call the axial direction of the spring has actually rotated by an amount that is theta, which you could calculate. So this sort of a nonlinearity is called a geometric nonlinearity, as opposed to a nonlinear system where maybe this mass is changing as a function of time, like a rocket that's burning off mass, or perhaps the spring K1 or K2 is a function of the displacement X1 and X2. In this sort of a problem, Vectors are your friend. I can't stress that enough. You see this problem a lot in structural dynamics, where, for example, you take a beam and you apply a load to it, and this beam displaces like this. Maybe the load's still being applied like that. It would be a legitimate question at that time to say, what is the axial direction of the beam? How do I define that? I'm not going to answer that question for you, because I'd like you to give it more thought. But this is the same sort of idea, and I just want to stress that vectors are a great way of treating this sort of problem. I know you guys are going to ignore me because, well, vectors are one of these things you learned a few years ago, and yeah, they're kind of magnitude direction, but I'll stress it again. Vectors are a great tool for solving this problem. So let's go ahead and make a note of the following vectors. The first are the unit vectors E1 and E2. E1 is just one zero. It points in what we'd call the horizontal direction, and E2 is 0, 1. It points upwards in the vertical direction. We'll number these equations 1 and 2. And then we can easily find vector R1, which is just P minus P1, and R2, which is P minus P2. Let's call these 3 and 4. And then to find the unit vector that points in the direction of R1 and R2 respectively, 
We just take each of the vectors and divide it by its magnitude. So what I'll call e hat r1, which is the unit vector in the r1 direction, is simply the vector r divided by its magnitude. And similarly, er2 is the vector r2 divided by its magnitude. We'll call these equations 5 and 6. And then I remind you that the magnitude of r1 is, and you can see this from the diagram, x1 plus l1 squared, that's this distance, plus x2 squared. So just using Pythagoras' theorem, and it's the square root of that. And similarly for r2, x2 plus l2, that's that distance there squared, plus x1 squared is that, is equal to the magnitude, or the square root of that is equal to the magnitude. We'll call these equations 7 and 8. Now the kinetic energy is easy to write. It's just T equals 1 half M X1 dot squared plus X2 dot squared. But I don't even want to focus on that right now because really the problem at hand is let's find the strain energy and more importantly, let's find the displacement in the springs as a function of X1 and X2. So now using vectors makes this dead simple. Consider the deflection or the stretch in each of the springs. Considering first spring 1 or delta 1, we can take the magnitude of R1, which is the final length of the spring, and subtract from that L1, the initial length of the spring. Substitution yields the square root of x1 plus L1 squared plus x2 squared minus L1. We'll number these equations 9 and 10. And then similarly for delta 2, it's the magnitude of R2, which is the final length of spring 2, minus L2, the initial length of spring 2, and that can be rewritten as the square root of x2 plus l2 squared plus x1 squared minus l2. We'll number these 11 and 12. So we have very easily now found the stretch in each of the springs using vectors. And you can see clearly from the expressions for delta 1 and delta 2 the nature of the nonlinearity and how moving x1 affects both delta 1 and delta 2 and, and similarly for x2. So now you might be saying, all right, we've got the deflection in the spring, and uh, the nice thing about using Lagrange's equations is I don't really need to consider the direction of this force, because I'm just going to store it as potential energy, and energy doesn't have direction. So turning the page, I'm first going to copy equation 10, the deflection, delta 1 in the spring, spring 1, and we're going to call the potential of spring 1 V1, and that's equal to 1 half times K1 times delta 1 squared. Now, it gets a little tedious mathematically squaring this thing, but not too hard. That's equal to 1 half times K1 times X1 plus L1 quantity squared plus X2 squared. So everything under the square root now just comes out. Minus 2 times L1 times X1 plus L1 squared plus X2 squared to the half plus L1 squared since the negative and the negative cancel. We'll call this equation 13. I'm going to treat each spring individually. First, I'm going to take the derivative of V1 with respect to coordinate X1, and that's equal to 1 half times K1 times, and then the first contribution is this term here. That becomes 2 times X1 plus L1, and then there's a contribution from this term here. Uh, so the first thing I need to do is take the derivative of the outside. A half cancels the 2. Okay, so I get minus L1 times all of this to the minus a half times 2x plus L1. The derivative of the inside is 2x to x1 plus L1. Now, I'm not going to waste your time dragging you through all the math. This simplifies a little bit more. And then eventually I can write the derivative of V1 with respect to x1 in a nice compact form as K1 times quantity x1 plus L1 times quantity 1 minus L1 divided by the magnitude of R1. And I remind you that the magnitude of R1 is simply the square root of X1 plus L1 squared plus X2 squared. We had this on the previous page. And then similarly, I can take the derivative of V1 with respect to X2. I'm going to save you the details. But when I go through all the math, this reduces to K1 times X2 times quantity 1 minus L1 over R1. This is the same quantity that we saw up here. Let's give these some numbers, number 14, 15, and 16. So now I'm going to proceed in exactly the analogous manner with 
delta 2 and spring 2 and finding the derivative of v2 with respect to x1 and x2. And what in fact I can do is take these results and put some boxes around it. So this result, that result. And if I just substitute a 2 in every place that I see a 1 and I substitute a 1 in every place that I see a 2, I can do exactly the same thing for v2. So delta 2 is equal to as we defined it before, equation 12. Then I can find the potential in the spring number 2, 1 half k2 times delta 2 squared. Squaring it and substituting it all in, I get this. And I can simplify it as before into these equations, where r2 is defined as we've shown on the first page. And we'll call these equations 18, 19, and 20. So now we can go ahead and substitute into Lagrange's equations. We begin by defining the Lagrangian L as t minus v, where in this case v is a combination of v1 plus v2. Lagrange's equations state that the time derivative of partial L partial q dot sub i minus partial L partial q is equal to capital Q sub i, which in this case is zero, because there are no external forces. We'll label these equation 21 and 22. And then when I substitute 21 into 22, we can write Lagrange's equations in the form the time derivative of partial t partial q dot i plus partial v1 partial qi plus partial v2 partial qi is equal to zero. We'll call this equation 23. And I'll remind you, I wrote it and deleted it earlier, that the kinetic energy T is just simply 1 half m x1 dot squared plus x2 dot squared. So on the next page, I can get the equations of motion by substituting equations 14, 16, 18, and 19 into equation 23. And we get in the case of x1, this equation of motion, mx1 double dot plus alpha 1 k1 times x1 plus l1 plus alpha 2 k2 times x1 equals 0, and in the x2 direction, mx2 double dot plus alpha 1 k1 x2 plus alpha 2 k2 times x2 plus l2 equals, where alpha 1 equals 1 minus l1 over the magnitude of r1, and alpha 2 is defined as 1 minus l2 over the magnitude of r2. Let's give these some numbers, 24, 25, 26, and 27. And of course, for good measure, the magnitude of R1 and R2, as we defined before. I'm just going to paste it in here. These were equations 7 and 8, I believe. So there you have the equations of motion in a fairly compact form, but they're actually quite complicated to look at. You know, I didn't mention that vectors were your friend for the sake of just mentioning it. I want to go back and I want to show you how to do this problem way more easily than we just did it, again, using vectors as a tool. Consider all the math that we did to get to this form of the equation. And true, we can now implement this in code very simply, but we did a lot of math to get here. And we took some shortcuts with that math. But I'm going to suggest to you, you know, all that we need to do is the two equations of motion are F equals MA in the two directions. And the only force is the spring force. The problem is we need to be able to decompose that spring force into its components in the E1 and E2 direction for the case of both spring K1 and also K2. So now we've got all these vectors defined. I can quite easily write an expression for the force vector, right? So F1, the force in the spring K1, is equal to the magnitude is K1 times delta 1, the displacement, and that's in the negative ER1 direction. Similarly, F2, the force in spring 2, is minus K2 delta 2 in the negative ER2 direction. So we know that the spring forces act in this direction, in the case of each spring. And all that we need to do to find the spring force in the E1 and the E2 direction is just take the dot product. Nothing could be simpler. So let's put a box around these. And then we're going to take those forces. And right here, we're going to just write that M x1 double dot equals, what are the forces? Let's add it together. F1 plus F2 dot E1. That's it. And similarly, m x2 double dot is equal to, again, the sum of the forces, 
f1 plus f2. Just add them in the vector sense, and now we just dot them in the e2 direction. And I'm going to suggest to you that you can let the computer do all the math here. This is something to be learned. You don't always need your equations of motion in explicit form. Sometimes if you're going to do a computer simulation of the problem, what you can do is have it in implicit form. In other words, define your functions and have the computer do the substitutions for you. So for example, instead of having to do all this math, let's just define the vectors. We know what the ER direction is. We've defined it here. Couldn't be simpler. We know how to find the R vector because it's from subtracting the two points. And that's it. So let's recap this very quickly. What I've suggested to you is a lot of the problems you find in structural engineering deal with nonlinearities in the form of geometric nonlinearities. As a result of large deflections, actually large rotations, the coordinate system of some of these elements will change. This has an effect of stiffening the system versus what a small displacement approximation would have. The idea is that in addition to producing the usual stiffness matrix, there'll be a component that's added to the stiffness matrix known as the geometric stiffness matrix. As a result of this, you get what's called geometric stiffening, and this is the nature of it. So the reason I've suggested to you not to just look at the, uh, the Lagrange's equations is because for these sort of problems which come up a lot in structural engineering, specifically geometric nonlinear problems, a really good way of tackling them is to use vectors. We can find this force vector, almost trivial to do, and without doing all this math that I've gone through to get the equations of motion, I can simply write the equations of motion in this form, where all I've done is I've taken the resultant force from the two springs, and I've dotted it with the appropriate direction to find the component in that direction. And I'm going to let the computer do all the math for me, because it does math better than I do. So I'm going to cut the video off at this point. I hope you learned something useful in it. If you have, please go ahead and hit those like buttons so others can get to view it too. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. If you'd like to be notified of new video releases, please go ahead and subscribe and hit those bells. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch up with you in the next video.